All right, thank you very much, guys. Usually when I talk, there's only like a couple of people, so there's a lot more of you than usually, so I'm a bit nervous. I actually woke up at 3 a.m. and went over to the speech and speech and speech and speech. So if I'm talking a bit fast, it's because I'm excited. Just, just told me to hold on. So my name is Nico Rantala, Rantala, and I came from Finland. So why am I qualified to talk about this stuff? Well, we have this company called Minefield Games, which was founded in 2013. And I'm also the co-founder of FIVR, which we founded in 2015. Minefield Games is a studio focused on VR games. And FIVR is a VR slash AR accelerator program that combines local VR doers, AR doers, investors in a VR, and media interested in VR. So my speech, it's going to be a general outlook of the VR market. How has it been? How is it now? How it probably is going to be? Mainly from an indie standpoint, and obviously my standpoint, I'm not a game maker, so I'm not going to talk about the design that much, but maybe some. So I hope by the end of this speech, I have answered three questions that you should be able to answer as well. What is the current state of VR if you're trying to sell? What's the biggest problem we have at the moment that's counteractively um, not allowing the market to go forward. I realize I use the word market a lot. I'm sorry about that. I come from finance, so <laughs> bear with me. And of course, how do we solve the problem that we have? So, pioneers get slaughtered and settlers prosper. There was a similar boom in VR in the 90s. Some of you might remember it. There were multiple well-funded high-growth companies, basically startups, looking to take advantage of the market. And if you look at the other picture here, it could be from an Oculus video, right? But it's from the 90s. So actually, there's a lot of points that go together with the markets now and the markets in the 90s. And hopefully, we can learn from these mistakes and prospect his time. So why didn't it pick off in the 90s? Well, computers weren't as powerful as they are now, which ended up lagging, nausea, and the prices were extremely high. Two of the most important reasons of this are the price, of course, and the quality of the content. So, the first lesson. The only competitor in the VR markets is non-adaption. It's not other VR companies. If you have two VR companies, there's absolutely no reason not to share your best practices and uh, general ideas about the market, where it's going, what kind of products work, what kind of designs work, and stuff like that. The biggest competition in the market is the fact that maybe consumers don't want to buy the product. Maybe they want to do something else with their time. So if we move to the current market, some of you are familiar with this. Some of you are probably new into virtual reality. So the big players on desktop side is Oculus, backed by Facebook. HTC Vive, backed by Vive. PSVR, Sony stuff. And a bit smaller OSVR, which is done by Razer in Singapore. On the mobile side, GRVR, done by Samsung in collaboration with Oculus, and Google Daydream, which was just released yesterday. So the difference with this, obviously, is that 
in the desktop version, you boot the classes and the desktop runs the software, whereas in the mobile, you just insert your, your um, mobile hand, handset into the head mounted display and it works as wireless free. So, if you're thinking now, I should start a company and do VR. When is it going to be profitable? How can I make money out of this? Well, you can talk to your peers, other developers. Usually, after a couple of beers, the answers come, oh yeah, the market's going to be 8 billion in 2020. No, 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 no. I heard it's going to be 50 billion in 2020. So take that advice with a grain of salt. Even I'm not the one who could foresee where this, this, this market is going. But there are more reputable institutions, private banks, big banks, who actively analyze the market. But even their predictions range from 20 billion to 180 billion. So apparently their crystal ball isn't as clear either. But usually their predictions are more based than the ones from your friends or other developers. So usually the predictions in VR are drawn on three historical adoption rates. PC adoption rate, smartphone and tablet. So, if you look at these three historical things, can we deduct the future of the market? Well, if you look at the data, the driver behind PC was the increased productivity of a worker in an enterprise. So actually, the driving force behind the PC market wasn't consumers until 2007. In 2006, 51% uh, of the PCs were sold to enterprises. So from that, we can deduct that in order for enterprises to adapt VR, there needs to be a qualifiable addition to the value. If you move on to the smartphone one, it didn't really kick off on the iPhone. We can discuss if iPhone is a good phone or not. That doesn't matter. But the only thing that matters is that the consumers like it very much. It sells very well. It has always sold very well. And it was the main driver behind smartphone adoption. When iPhone came out, everyone else was doing, uh, after that, smartphones as well. Some did before, but they were unable to drive the market forward. So from that, we can decide that um, consumers need the killer device or killer app. In this case, it was iPhone. But such a device doesn't exist in the current VR market, at least yet. If we would have that now, we would have massive amounts of VR gear out there, but we don't. Oh yeah, I already said that. So, therefore, we can conclude that in order for the maximum amount of stuff moving, so to say, we need a killer device for the consumers and we need added value to the enterprises. And that's, neither of those things are true yet. But hopefully, within five to ten years, we will see a difference in this. Both of these are positively affected by the price of the gear. It's easier for a consumer to think that, oh yeah, this is a must-have product if the price is lower. It's easier for the enterprises to see, 
oh yeah, we need to get this stuff because it increases our workers' efficiency if the stuff is cheaper. And the general trend in prices usually have been that it's going down. And if you compare to the 90s prices of VR gear, it's actually a lot cheaper by now. And hopefully the future, or not hopefully, but statistically, if you look into the history of uh, IT, it's, the price is going to go down. So the adoption rate will rise. I have two graphs here, the computer price index, which is mostly, like I said, enterprise driven, which has lowered in time over time, making it more and more common. Same thing with the TV graph, except that it's driven by consumers. The main audience for TVs is you guys, not companies. Both have dropped in price, so we can assume that future generations of VR gear will become cheaper and therefore more accessible and therefore the market for developers will grow as well. Well, how's it look for an indie perspective right now? Now is the time to experiment. Now is the time to fail. And now is the time to learn. If you fa wait five years and you go into the market, it's going to be more expensive to enter the market. It's going to be more expensive to fail. It's going to be more expensive to learn. So now is the perfect time to start developing for VR. But the actual market for content, for example, in Steam, it's very low, very low compared to a normal PC game. Basically, only early adopters are present, which of course helps targeting. I don't think it's a coincidence that all the games that were initially done for VR were sci-fi games. It was sci-fi games made by sci-fi fans to sci-fi fans. However, at the moment, if you look at the Steam data, you'll see that the HTC Vive install base hasn't grown in two months. So from that, we can deduct that the consumers are waiting for the next generation. So at the moment, there's no expansion in that area. Only a very few who I know have actually broken even in VR. It's very important to have the price or the budget of your game uh, comparable to the market size. I just read that the CCP, who has invested 30 million USD into the market, is about to break even. But I don't know if you can trust that because it's not a listed company, so they can say whatever they want. But from, for example, from our uh, perspective, I mean, we are a small studio, uh, 10 employees. Uh, it's almost impossible to break even at the moment. So what can a small indie do? Well, we are mainly funded by business-to-business products. We haven't raised that much investment. We are basically living on business-to-business -business products. But we are also doing the games at the same time. And it doesn't mean that business-to-business -business isn't games. It's usually advertising that's very, like, gamified. So it's perfect for a game developer get that extra runway going. Because you need to be in this game in five years. If you start now, you need to plan five years at least ahead. You can't expect that you're going to make a game now and make a profit next year. That's not going to happen. Or it might happen, but if you're smart, you'll plan further. 
So why is B to B viable? Doesn't need the same penetration of the hardware. Usually it's done so that the companies have the products, they see the added value, they have them, and then they display them to their customers. So the customers doesn't, don't actually need the expensive gear. Furthermore, at least in Finland, uh, many large corporations are very curious about VR, and they have huge marketing budgets. And uh, they are going to, or they are willing, very willing actually, to try out something new from that budget. We get almost, almost every week, we get uh, tenders from companies asking that if we could collaborate on something. And it's usually something like gamified marketing. So that's a great way to finance the game development. And I also think that the first big successes, not counting Oculus, of course, which was sold to Facebook, are going to come from the business-to-business -business side. Whereas there's still time till we see a huge game that makes a lot of money in VR. Obviously, because no one has the headsets, or no one, but not as many. So what's different from the 90s? Computers much more efficient. Not as much lag if you do the game correctly. Better graphics. Content quality is better, at least compared to the 90s or the late 80s ET games. And furthermore, hardware prices are more affordable. Of course, one of the most frequent questions you get about this is that what about locomotion and nausea? That's obviously one of the big elephants in the room. And I think that's, that's the biggest design challenge that everyone who wants to do VR is going to have. It's easy to do in the Vive because you have this room scale and you move there. Um, Usually you hear all kinds of explanation as to why you get sick. And usually the answers are like blah, 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 blah. But the real reason, we did research this. So when you have your headset on, your eyes think you're there, right? You move forward with the controller without actually moving. So your legs are relaying information to your brain that you are not moving, while your eyes are relaying information that you are moving. Now, our primitive brain, of course, considers that, oh yeah, I've eaten some uh, poisonous berries. This is a poisoning. What's the best way to get poison out of you? Blah. So that's basically what happens. That's the essence of it. If you can go around that, then you already solved uh, the problem. So the second lesson is don't expect quick victories. VR is a marathon, not a 100 meter dash. You need to have planned way ahead, unless the odds are against you if you don't. So our first game, uh, we released it in April. It's called Pollen, Sail on Steam. A very inter interesting title. Uh, I believe it was the first commercial VR thing outside of CCP that was like announced. But it was supposed to be a one-year project. And then it ended up being released in 2016. So, what did we learn? First of all, consumers are not ready to price in the VR. Normally, a game uh, in the length of pollen, it's like 
maybe four hours, five hours, six hours. You could um, sell that in the US for $15. Well, we thought that because it's VR, we'll sell this for $24. It's a fair, fair asking. It's a lot more expensive to develop for VR, so. But that was all the biggest lashback that we got. Uh, if you look at the Steam page, there are people who are really unhappy about the price compared to the content of the game or the length of the game. And it, it, it's, it's not only us, but it's if you were looking at Rainer yesterday, they have this Everest VR game, they have the exact same issue, they have the same price and the same complaints about the price. Furthermore, there was this big, bigger game called Job Simulator, uh, and they had to lower their price, price within the first week with $15. So at least yet, even if you have a 1,000 euro computer, you have 800 euro HTC Vive, you're not ready to pay for the content, the extra 10 bucks. So that's something to keep in mind if you're developing for VR. Well, the other thing that uh, bite us in the ass, so to say, um, we were too optimistic about the hardware. We started the company in 2013 when Oculus was still in Kickstarter. Now that's, that's crazy. Like, yeah, we're going to do stuff for this technology that's still in infancy. Well, they were supposed to release in 2014. We believed it. We have good relations with them, we talked and... But then they pushed. 2015. All right, so we know it didn't come out in 2015, so they postponed it to 2016. And we just kept adding, all right, all right, that we still have time, let's add this, fe this feature and change the storyline here and here and here and here and here. And the end result is a three-year game, and obviously that's three times the money that we intended to spend initially. So obviously that's not a very good choice to do if you know the market is small. Another issue was that uh, we wanted to do everything like really photorealistic then. But over the time, as Oculus pushed and pushed and pushed, the production, the graphical requirements came harder and harder and harder from what they initially announced. So that resulted in an expensive game that was expensive to develop and really re demanding from the hardware. I hope this helps you guys. <laughs> So the biggest problem at the moment is the egg and chicken problem. Consumer install base is so small that studios don't want to invest a lot of money into content creation. But then again, the content base is so small that consumers don't want to invest in hardware. Obviously, that has a lot to do with the price of the equipment. But uh, there's also uh, another way to solve this problem, and it is to aggregate the development of VR content. So content is king, and like in lesson one, it's important to share your best practice with the others. I think we have, uh, in, in, in Finland, we have this uh, culture of sharing in the games industry. It's pretty unique. And uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that Finland has been very successful in games. So I think if we share in VR also, we can become successful in VR. Then there's like multiple programs for studios. VZs and manufacturers have their own, most notably, Vive X Global Accelerator, which is in 3D spaces, I think, at the moment. Then there's our stuff, FIVR Hub. We currently have 
15 teams working in free spaces, free gear, free everything. Then there's stuff like OSVR Dev Fund and uh, Virtual Reality Venture Capital Alliance, which is basically VCs stacked together who are interested in investing in VR, and you can reach them all at once. So what we did in Finland, we established FIVR, which is a non-profit organization. Um, we currently have two locations in Helsinki. We are opening three more. Currently 15 teams. Uh, we're combining developers, investors, media. And basically, if you have an idea, or if your team has an idea that I want to do this, or I want to try this in VR or AR, you can just send me an email, and if it makes any sense, if it looks like viable stuff that you could do, I'm not charging the end product, but uh, we'll give you free working space and free development tools and stuff like that. I think the more that we have content producers going on, the more there's going to be like eventual hit products that will drive the market forward. So that's only natural. So it's kicked up, kicked up really fast. We started in 2015. Uh, we already, our teams have gotten seed funding. They already developed first products. And I think we're on the fast track on taking uh, Finland to the next level of VR development so that it will become the VR capital of the world eventually. That's my vision, at least. But yeah, basically, the more companies we can get creating the content, the less chicken egg problem there will be. That's basically it. So I'd like to leave you with this one final thought of sharing. If you guys are considering uh, forming a game dev group here that we share, it's only natural to take in the VR as well. So you guys could have like this VR gaming hub. It will not happen instantly, but you have to start somewhere. And I think uh, there's a lot of potential in Kiev. But uh, like I said, I, I don't think it's an, uh, the linearity between the sharing and the success of the industry is, is linked in my, my opinion. So I can encourage all of you to think about this and find people who think the same way and organize yourself in some way. Just remember that ideas aren't actually worth anything. It's the execution that counts. Well, that was it. Thank You're you, welcome. Nika. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> questions? Thank you, Nico. Interesting um, case study uh, from your own experience. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, could you not have asked the uh, manufacturers to sponsor the game. I, I, I know it's, it's a chicken and egg situation at mm. the moment. The hardware wasn't ready, the developers have put their money towards it, uh, and we ended up not being able to sell anything because the expectation isn't there. Everybody yeah, expects yeah, yeah. free content. Yeah. Do they provide any help, any financial? Yeah, you could have asked, and um, we did ask. We have gotten some support. We have always gotten the dev kits and stuff like that. Um, we also got some money. But um, when we started in 2013, I don't think HTC Vive was even announced yet. So, yeah. so uh, this just like went over that. But in the next project that we already started, we're like um, getting more and more interaction between the hardware manufacturers and seeing what they want from the content and maybe sponsor it. So that's something to think about, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for your speech. Um, talking about teams that I are going to start uh, development, could you suggest uh, something, I don't know, maybe some hard cases from your experience, what things that should uh, pay attention, what hard uh, issues you have met during your uh, during your development, your product? Mm, uh, 
from a team standpoint, uh, it's about mainly locomotion when you're making games. That's the hardest thing, of course, to design. Because you can't really take an old game and make it VR, because it's most probably going to suck. So design is everything in VR. That's the most important issue. Did I answer your question? All right. Uh, anything else? You can also just come talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. I'm here all day. Thank you, Nick, again. Thanks.